Hello, I'm Dennis Livesey. Steam locomotives are living beasts. They breathe, they exhale steam. They snort, and rumble, intimately interact with their handlers. Sadly, I never saw one run until after the demise of mainline steam in 1960. Therefore, my presentation, Steam, 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 is an image compilation taken over 45 years that is the result of my repeatedly seeking out the beast and to unearth just what attracts me to this. Man's first machine that tells you at every turn it is alive. With these images, I hope to recreate, capture, and understand a time when steam was king, a time I never knew. In August of 1974, I was a freshly minted NYU film student, and I was with my fellow filmmakers, Rob and Amy, and we were on a, a road trip from New York to Los Angeles. We were going to make it in Hollywood. Well, being a film nut that I am, and train nut that I am, I cajoled a, uh, a side trip to Durango, Colorado. I'll never forget uh, being there with my uh, brand new Nicromat camera filled with a fresh roll of Kodak Ektachrome film. And I walked up to, unlike today, where you could be restricted, you could walk anywhere you wanted in the Durango yard. And so I walked right up to the doorway of the roundhouse and I looked inside. And then that moment, all those images that I had seen by Lucius Beebe, Charles Clegg, Jim Shaughnessy about the Durango narrow gauge came to life. So I snapped this shot and uh, I barely knew what I was doing, but I, I knew what I liked. And uh, this is like pretty much the first railroad image that, I, that has any sort of an artistic quality to it. I just thought it was pretty cool. I also like the fact that you can't see the stack here, with this ridiculous balloon stack. So uh, skipping ahead, boom. Well, now it's 1981, I'm married. My career has started, I'm a father, uh, but I was able to cajole a weekend away and take in my very first uh, railroad uh, photographer charter weekend. And I picked a, a Steamtown Rail Fan Weekend in uh, the fall of 1981. I read about it in uh, uh, Rail Fan Magazine that was edited by uh, the one and only Jim Boyd. And he had uh, played up in 1981, I said, yeah, I want a bit of that. So also, um, Steamtown at the time was run by Don Ball, an incredible photographer, and also a really good friend of Boyd. So the two of them worked together in making rail fan wonderful rumbys and, and, and uh, uh, you know, contests. Well, it had been two days, of fabulous stuff with, with all sorts of locomotives, uh, diesel, steam, uh, even a Stanley steamer, beautiful fall colors and what have you. Well, the very last, they saved the best, most magnificent set of rumbines for the last setup on Sunday. And uh, this was the very, very, very last rumbine of them all. Now, oh, you'll see on the picture, um, that, well, actually, way over on the right-hand side, there's a whole bunch of people just, just out of frame. And that's where everybody was, including Ball and Boyd. And they were all there going, doing these really cool uh, 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 way shots. I didn't want that, and uh, so I came on over here to try and get away from all the people. And one other fellow uh, came by fairly close to me. I know Steve Barry was there as well. But anyway, I'm looking at the meter, and the sun's going down, and it's cloudy, and there's like no light. And uh, I shot this with black and white film, Triax 400 ASA, and um, I think I was down like in a 120th range. Ooh. But fortunately, the locomotives weren't moving that quickly, so they're still sh they're reasonably sharp. And uh, I love this double reflection. The, the, uh, the reeds on the water just work really nicely, I think. And uh, doggone. It's funny, the lead locomotive, 2317, is uh, in storage at Steamtown, which when I had a chance to work with it a little bit. Um, no, that's not true. But at Steamtown, I can get to see her uh, every time I go. 
the other locomotive, the uh, 1246, uh, she is still with us. She's in Thomaston, Connecticut. Aha. Okay, kids, figure out where this is. If you don't say the East Broad Top, you're, well, you're wrong. Because it is. In 1995, one of their fall spectaculars, um, I was, you know, I, I like this shot because it's a little more of a, a knuckle level uh, shot. It encompasses uh, the shops in the background and uh, the number 15 and the number 12. I'm a particular favorite, uh, 12 is a favorite built in 1911 by Baldwin, as uh, Baldwin was also built in 15 as well. All the locomotives still extant there were built by Baldwin. And one of the things I like about 19, early, uh, early 20th century, uh, World War I era, with Baldwin, they're small locomotives. You just can't beat them for good lines. Nothing too big, nothing too small. But um, I'd always wanted to emulate as best I could uh, the great photographers. I, I was inspired by Steinheimer, Hastings, Shaughnessy, uh, Plowden, Ball, um, or Winston Link. And, uh, you know, I learned how to appreciate those and uh, recognize, you know, good, good looking stuff. But at this point, I was really starting to get serious about this stuff, but I, I was having trouble uh, figuring out um, how to do it. I knew what I liked. I knew what I didn't like, but I still hadn't figured out how to get what I liked. So the, this one happened to work. And at this period uh, in my life, most everything that uh, was successful, I would say was as much luck as any uh, possible talent I might have had. Working in the movies, I was in love with the great Charles Scurll lighting of, oh, say, uh, Citizen Kane's uh, um, Greg Toland, or, uh, you know, the uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid shot by uh, the incredible Conrad Hall. And these guys, they, they broke rules. They shot into lights. They weren't supposed to do that. You know, there were lens flares. Oh, gosh, that's just the mark of an unprofessional. So um, I got to admit, I, I got kind of tired of, you know, flatly lit, you know, sun over the shoulder, Kodak moment kind of things. And I wanted to try, you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, you can't see the guy's face. You can't see the whole locomotive. Oh, it's a terrible rail fan picture. But it's an interesting uh, interpretive kind of photograph, something I, this is the kind of stuff I wanted to explore, stuff that could reach not only myself, but my viewers as uh, some sort of emotional connection. In, um, let's see, it's 1996. Ross Rowland brought uh, CNO 484 number 614 to New Jersey for a set of Hoboken to Port Jervis, New York excursions. Built by Lima in 1948, number 614 was the USA's last commercially built passenger steam locomotive. Well, knowing that uh, 614, uh, it, it, it's the place where it ran was in the Virginia Appalachian Mountains, I just couldn't resist the idea of doing something incredibly in contrast to that. And what could be more of a contrast than the New Jersey Meadows? Here she comes. Uh, one of the thrilling aspects of this was Ross was not afraid to uh, give her the leash. And there was plenty of miles run at 70, even 80 miles an hour behind this gorgeous, magnificent 484 roller bearing, one piece roller bearing uh, castings. It was fantastic. I, mean, I really missed them and what to do them again. Well, here we are. Here I was, you know, I was, I was fighting myself because I was so trying to be, you know, rail fan type photographer. 
full lighting and so forth, because I wanted to get into magazines. Uh, I didn't know how. I couldn't write anything. Um, the, the best way to get into magazines would have news stuff. I never took news stuff. This is just a detail thing. It would be, it would be something like, I dream about those wonderful articles uh, in Trains Magazine by Richard Steinheimer, where you have you know, photos at one after another, all those magnificent shots that, you know, didn't tell a particular thing about how the southern cities went over the mountains or anything like that. It's just, they were just pictures, incredible pictures. So I, I still was, and this is the days of film, where you had uh, 36 exposures per roll of film. Now today I have one card, 32 gigabyte card, I'm gonna take almost a thousand pictures. At this time, you know, we had to be very cognizant of this. You didn't just take shots uh, because you felt like it. You, you, you had to um, think about it. Anyway, I couldn't resist. I mean, this, this thing has what is charo squirrel lighting that i like um conrad hall my my friend rob uh, wound up uh, being conrad hall's assistant and operator and at a meeting i had with rob later uh after rob had become a director of photography he said connie conrad hall said that um, when it comes to looking at a beautiful photograph and, and what makes it beautiful I'll say that I want you to think about every single beautiful photograph you've ever seen. Every single one. Look at it. Look at it for a while and you will start to realize, as Conrad said, what there was was there was light against dark or dark against light. It's that contrast that our eyes pick up. It's that contrast where it causes our, I say, that our eyes start to dance with excitement. We, we live on that. And that's the kind of stuff that you get with high contrast lighting. Like you, you see these two fellows in 614's cab. And I heard somebody else once say, sorry, I don't remember who. They said, the exciting things in a photograph, the exciting things in a story, a movie, uh, it's not so much what's in the, the light, the mystery, the emotion that's in the dark. So as a photographer, as a cinematographer, you have to learn how to control contrast. And that's part of the magic. Ah, it's uh, 2008 and I've turned digital. And uh, let's see, 2008. I had heard about in 2007 that they that Steamtown had run this train up to Nicholson, Pennsylvania, and it was here on the Delaware Lackawanna's uh, Western's magnificent Tunghannock Viaduct. At one time, it was the largest concrete structure in the world. It's hundreds of feet high, thousands of feet long. It, it is pretty amazing. Um, anyway, the the excursion comes up here, stops. Everybody gets to take a look for about 10, 15 minutes, and then they start up and they leave. Well, this was after they had started up and they were leaving. I was in the, my car. Um, I'd been in the car for you know, a couple of hours, pouring rain, just pouring rain. And nothing was going on. The train shows up, stops for a while, starts up. And I wasn't particularly prepared for this shot, so I'm in the car and I have to twist around like this. And my right leg starts to be cramping in excruciating pain. And right at that moment, I'm getting this shot. As you see, my phone, my cell phone was in my rear pocket going zzz, zzz. <sighs> Well, I got the shot anyway. This kind of stuff, this kind of photograph goes in what I like to do. I like that how this thing is kind of magical. Because of the, uh, the gray sky, the rain, it's very soft, this telephoto shot. It's soft around the edges. And it's kind of uh, ethereal. It's kind of dreamlike. And rather than some 
razor sharp image. This one I think works better because it hints more to our inner imagination. Speaking of softness and imagination, uh, this was also in 2008, it's, it's Steamtown. That's uh, the 2317 in the background. And on the left is uh, Ray, uh, our car man, and over on the right with the cap, that's uh, Big Mike Prisco. Um, Big Mike is uh, one of the mechanics. Um, big guy, taller than I am, uh, Boilermaker, so that all works well for him as well as wrestling with his enormous uh, bike, uh, motorbikes. Anyway, the freedom of digital allowed me to take this shot. I, I, I don't know why I took it. At the scene, it didn't look like much, um, but I said, ah, what the heck, I'll shoot it anyway. So I did, and when I got it home on the computer, I'm looking at it, I said, man, it's, it's, it's not much to look at. And then I made an exercise for myself. Well, let's see what I can do with this. So I played around with it and voila, this thing happened. All of a sudden it goes from a bland color shot to this um, mysterious, uh, ethereal again, uh, kind of dreamlike image, which again, I think feel goes more to the heart. Uh, I'm sometimes asked by people wanting to know, uh, what do I prefer, shooting black and white or, or in color? And uh, my feelings about that is um, they're both tools that the photographer gets to use. And the photographer makes the choice about which one is the most appropriate for each particular image. So I will say that uh, if you want more reality, I think color works because we see in color. I think if cameras were in color from the very beginning, you'd be more used to it. And instead of black and white, out of necessity was uh, the, the medium of choice, uh, necessity. And so we had to use black and white for like a hundred years. But there's this quality of black and white because it strips away the color. And now you're just working with tones. And now you're de dealing with light and shadow. I like to feel that what it does is since it strips away all of that stuff and just simplifies it down to just a, the light and shadow, that what happens is in effect, it becomes a main line to your emotions. It goes right, in, right into your mind's eye immediately with incredible power. And that's, I think, the, the beauty of black and white. Ah, this is one of my favorites. I, uh, you know, there's just not many roundhouses around and certainly not in existence and certainly not really any ones with live steam engines. So I, I'd been goofing around up at Steamtown for a while then, and I'd never sh tried this shot. I was initially just trying to get the engine because you see there's a vacant stall in front of us. That's 514 is normally there blocking this view. But uh, she hadn't come back in yet, and uh, 54 was done for the day. And in front there is uh, Don Young and his fireman, uh, Jim Yarwood. They're, this is, they're literally, they got their grips. I mean, this is a shot that, this is an occurrence that happened in this very roundhouse, how many thousands of times? You know, these are the engine crew, they're clocking off, they're marking off from work. They're gonna go over to the right there and sign out. So this is about as real as it can be. Yes, it's recreation. Yes, it's, it's a, you know, a museum, but everything there is done exactly the same way it was back in the day. Now, as far as shooting is concerned, see those lights on top? I normally hate those lights. They're just usually this industrial yellow, blah. And who thought of that? Thought it was okay. Um, they're very efficient. There's a lot of light per wattage. But I discovered 
particularly on this shot, is that even though there are multiple ones just shooting straight down, look at it. It, it turns the lighting of the two men into something like a Hollywood film noir. You know, not only is there that huge shadow preceding them, it's a black shadow, it, they're also rim lighted from the back. You know, they've got this strong backlighting, and that helps add dimension. If you notice old Hollywood movies, the black and white ones in particular, they always have some sort of backlighting, right? You know, like what's happening to me here? It's a little, little light up that way. You know, it helps define, it helps define the image, helps define the subject, it, it gives depth. Now, the guy who took these pictures behind me, some guy named o. Winston Link, he was very fond of well, not fond of, he, he, he was adamant about creating depth. I mean, we're working in this little box, it's got two dimensions, right? But of course, there's all of this stuff going on. You know, third dimension, but we just got this little box. So trying to create depth in, in to a photo is generally what you want to do. You know, sometimes they could have you know, something here, you know, the foreground and something in the background. So it gives that illusion, like you're really seeing something. Ah, the fabled ring of fire. I was, uh, I had never gotten my hands dirty uh, working on steam locomotives or anything, really outside of working with my own Lionel, I guess that doesn't count. But anyway, uh, in 2010, uh, the Valley Railroad was in need of more power. They only had a couple of uh, American steam locomotives and they were, uh, their business was increasing, they really needed a third. So um, the gentleman in front here, uh, J. David Conrad, who had been instrumental in bringing, uh, golly, I don't remember the number, I think it was four, uh, Mikado's brand new from China, from the last factory on the planet making brand new steam locomotives in 1988, I think it was. He had been instrumental in, in bringing those over. And uh, one of them wound up in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, that, that particular line had a, a devastating uh, bridge collapse. And then on top of that, arson on the roundhouse. So the valley went over and they, they bought this this locomotive and they were in the process of restoring out of all the four drive uh, eight drive wheels this was the one that had the bad uh, rim so that's why we're doing the ring of fire uh, i participated in this in that the ring itself i helped move from the warehouse the storehouse to here uh, hooked up to a couple of gas tanks we set this thing on fire let it cook for i think it was about 40 minutes just to raise it so the tire was just hot enough that with mallets so uh, we banged it off uh, it's a pretty cool shot in color but the texture of the flames in black and white just was just too intoxicating that's why it wound up in black and white and here's the very locomotive itself obviously i'm an admirer of wink and I'd seen uh, the wonderful work that Tom Nanos had uh, done at this very spot. So he inspired me to try myself. Well, what you're seeing here is the culmination of like three years of effort. Uh, yeah, I, there, you know, three years of failed attempts. But uh, as they sometimes say, uh, third time's the charm. So this one, uh, I use three cheap speed lights. Well, not three cheap one, I had a nice Canon one with two cheap uh, Vivitars and a cheap uh, Young Gunnel uh, flash triggers. I have a, a light over on the left side of the locomotive hitting the fire uh, smoke box. Uh, another one uh, uh, you know, hitting the uh, tender. And my third one was behind the locomotive shooting straight up to catch that clown. All three of these uh, lights also wanted to capture the trees. You know, give it a frame. I find uh, uh, just pure black sky is really dead stuff. Uh, you need to have something around the black sky. 
need something that, you know, if were possible, I'd have to assume the, the, the moon and the stars, but uh, I'm not that So we got this one, I was really happy with it. And uh, so were the friends of the Valley Railroad who decided to put this on their cover of uh, the 2017 uh, calendar, which featured uh, photographs by yours truly. Because in 1988, that I first saw this fabulous locomotive. Of course, it's uh, the nickel plate uh, S2, S2, uh, 284 superpower uh, Berkshire, uh, Berkshire type locomotive, which gained fame on the nickel plate for their uh, David versus Goliath kind of existence against the New York Central and Penzi in running trains from uh, St. Louis and Chicago to Buffalo. And the reason why they could do it was that they figured out how to use these machines. These machines are meant to uh, get a heavy train up to speed quickly and keep it there for hours. These things were very comfortable, uh, 45, 50, 60, even 70 miles an hour. Um, and that's how they were able to deliver and compete against much larger railroads. Um, anyway. Uh, by 1918, the Fort Wayne Historical Society, uh, 1988, sorry, 1988, the Fort Wayne Historical Society had, had this locomotive for several years, a couple of decades. Anyway, um, it was part of the, the NRHS uh, uh, convention, and I was able at Boundbrook to, uh, a friend of mine was a reporter, and he was in the cab, and so I just sort of joined them, and uh, that was my first time. And, I had some wonderful experiences with them. Well, let's see what, this is now uh, 2015. And in 1988, this was 27 years later, uh, the locomotive was in uh, you know, Northeast Pennsylvania for a couple of incredible trips in, uh, on the uh, Pocono Main Line and to Strasburg, Pennsylvania, East Strasburg, and uh, also in the Lehigh Valley, uh, River Gorge from uh, Allentown to uh, Pittson in return. I uh, happen to know the firemen. These are the tracks that I work as a uh, conductor. So it was pretty easy for me to you know, invite myself into the cab. Here we see uh, the 765 deep within the uh, Lehigh Valley River Gorge at uh, Jim Thorpe. Now, like with the other Lima 614, I wanted to show this 765 in a contrast to what it was used to. It's a, you know, known as a flat line, a, f a flatlander um, speedster. And here I wanted to make her into a mountain mower. It's just an enormous machine. Well, we go from enormous to miniature. Here we are in, uh, I think it's pronounced Shepska, Maine. Or Alma, Maine. I'm confused, but anyway, uh, this is the Wiscasset, Waterville, and Farmington uh, Railroad, which is its legit legitimate name. As it turns out, when they started rebuilding the WWF, the original charter had never been canceled. So a group of guys got together, had a meeting, and boom, it was back in business. They were running under their original charter. Amazing. What's more amazing is the fact that the, the guys, gals who run this thing, they're unfazed by anything. They will just do whatever it takes. Need a turntable? Let's build a turntable. Need to relay track on a, a main line that hasn't seen service since 1933? Not a problem. Let's go. Oh, gosh. We only have one steam locomotive. Well, let's build another one. I, it, it's utterly amazing. Now, granted, uh, these are two foot gauge uh, railroad equipment, and they're much smaller than standard gauge, you know, big boys or something. Still, these people uh, get more done in a second than lots of people do in decades. Here we are in the WWF, in a place on the railroad known as Top of the Mountain. Um, uh, to all you folks out in the Rockies, this is, well, amusing. But uh, for us back here in the east, this is, this is, calls, this is a pretty good hill. 
Uh, you can't see it, but the, the main line goes behind the train and down a, a pretty steep grade. I know, 2% maybe, maybe three. I'm not sure. Please don't shoot. But anyway, um, the preponderance of WWF traffic was lumber and from the north end of the railroad. So coming south, the, the train here is southbound. Uh, they would stop at the bottom of the hill, cut off half the train, uh, come up to here, drop that half of the train, run around it, run the engine back down to the other half, pull that up, reassemble here. Uh, that's how the, the siding allows it, that to happen. They reassemble, and then they continue uh, toward the camera, southbound, on their way. This is known as doubling the hill. Over on the left, uh, you'll see a lot of tree stubs and stuff. That's the current WWNF. They're hoping to put a, a, a live action uh, sawmill there. Since the um, main product that the uh, railroad hauled was lumber, this would be like an ideal uh, demonstration. This speaks to uh, one of the fascinating things about the WWNF. Everything there, it, it's new. There's freshly turned earth. There's lumber that's just been cut. There's buildings under construction. Uh, you're there laying track. And you've got track gangs and ties and ballast and banging of rails and sledgehammers and stuff. And the whole atmosphere is like a construction camp. And talk about historic recreation. It's like, it's 1894, I think that was the original date for the railroad to be built. It's, it's like you're really there. Unlike most um, heritage lines where they've been in place for decades and everything's kind of overgrown and comfortable and green and stuff, these guys, it's raw stuff. It's, it's like you're really there again. Ah. Brakeman Bill Baskerville. This was a, a charter that we were uh, doing. And uh, we were in there. They built this caboose to plans. This is a new caboose, but they built it to original plans. And uh, Bill was stoic, uh, doing his job, making sure the train was okay. Uh, five cars. Anyway, while well, the rest of the guys were in the car, having a good talk, I was still shooting. And this idea came to me. I wanted to get the, uh, the motion as much as possible because Bill was just standing there and nothing much was, it would be all right as uh, a regular still photo, but I just wanted that motion. So I risked it, did, uh, I don't know, I think this is about a 15th of a second. And I kept firing. Kept firing, kept firing, I was bracing myself against the wall as best I could. And with things like with digital, you can shoot, 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 and one of them's going to be okay. And I think I probably took 30 exposures, and this is the one that worked. Bill, the camera, just stayed in place just enough so that the all important face is, is tack sharp and the background is blurry and it goes off into this wonderful. Receding uh, rails there. I love on the left side this kind of trapezoidal look of a doorway. I mean, it, this thing speaks to the human connection to these trains. I mean, these trains can't run without people. And here's a person, genuine uh, article. He's doing a job. And uh, he's not like the olden days where you have a cowboy, uh, cops and robbers of a train. You know, this. He's really doing his job. Another man doing his job. I, unfortunately, I don't know this fireman's name. He's giving a blowdown to Strasburg's uh, mogul, number 89. Uh, she's a cute little machine. And she's probably everybody's favorite mogul. But even though she's little, as you can see, she makes a huge steam bath for herself. Aha. I worked on several motion pictures with a camera operator by the name of Steve Trellick. Good man, good friend. And he saw this thing and he couldn't help but saying, aha, a railroad maison scene. 
Mezalsen is a, obviously French, but it's speaking about um, the careful, artful arrangement of objects in an aesthetically pleasing way in order to tell a story either on stage play or a movie. Here we have uh, a good old 3254, our Canadian uh, National Mikado built in 1917. We've got Tom Wyatt above, looking down at his fireman, Jack Emmerich, and then with uh, trainman uh, Doug Noop looking up. Interestingly, Tom uh, started his railroad career for at the Penn Central and uh, running GG1s. He ended his uh, career uh, for Amtrak running AEM 7s between uh, 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 Philadelphia and Harrisburg. Jack's father uh, was Jack Emmerich the first or second, second, second. And he was involved with the locomotive not far from where we were standing, the uh, Decker uh, 759, Ross Rowland uh, locomotive that Ross took on the, uh, let's see, I want to get the name right. Get the name right. Sorry, sorry. Ah, yes. Jack's father was an Amtrak engineer, retired as one, but who was a young fireman in 1969, fired NKP 759 on Ross Rowland's Golden Spike Centennial Limited. Here we have um, good old 3254 on its way from uh, Scranton to Moscow on a typical uh, excursion. Uh, years before, I'd seen uh, uh, National Park Service uh, house photographer Kenny Gantz, an exceptionally good photographer, uh, take a, a photo of uh, the 2317 at this spot. Now, normally, uh, what you see behind it is, is a large mountain because the railroad is running through this gap here. It was called Cobb's Gap, but I'm not sure. Don't hold me to it. But anyway, I set up here. I used my, uh, uh, even though I was digital, I was using my old uh, film uh, 300 millimeter, a Nikkor F45, because I wanted to compress it as much as possible. And uh, so it's set up on a tripod, and I've got this thing. And I, I range focused it. Just a new where that I wanted the locomotive to be sharp so I didn't have to worry about focusing and all this sort of stuff. Well, the train hoves into view. It's coming around from the left there. And it looked pretty normal. Lots of, it was November or something like that. So the air is very cool. And so there's no black smoke. Jack Emmerich was the new fireman. Excellent, excellent fireman. Um, but what's coming out is, you know, the condensed steam, which is this water vapor. And what was happening because it was in this gap, this, the, the wind was behind it, blowing the smoke. Instead of dissipating the vapor, it was piling it up, piling it up like you know, whipped cream. And I, I'm looking at the camera and I go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Ah. I did, it just was, wow. So that's how that happened. This is a Scranton, Steamtown. That's Ron Kumano. Uh, he uh, has been a conductor for, I don't know, since the Eisenhower administration. I don't know, it's a long time. Uh, I mentored under him and Ron said, as he says to all of his uh, candidates, he said, don't ride when you can sit. No, don't stand when you can sit. Don't ride. Don't walk when you can ride, and don't do any jo job that you can't make some other some other guy do. At this particular moment, it, Ron was having a bad day so far. He was uh, overseeing a conductor trainee. There have been some minor slip ups and uh, so forth. And he was sitting there, and I caught this moment. And uh, the moment he saw me, he he started laughing. He thought it was pretty funny, but. Um, Seconds later, the there was an emergency. We big hold it, and boom! And uh, the, our train stopped. We got up to look around, and we turned out that we had a break in two there in the yard. So Ron's bad day got even worse.
Oh boy. Again, roundhouses. There was lights, steam. Uh, I came around the corner. Uh, Aaron Stout, the engineer, was pulling away. I made sure I got the focus right there on the number boards. And I uh, got this wonderful steam because the, the uh, cylinder cocks were open, uh, which is mandatory with a steam locomotive startup. So making all this steam, gentle uh, vapor and so forth. Again, it's, it was cool. I think it was November, December. And that's uh, Mike, uh, one of the mechanics, and he set the scene. As big as steam locomotives are, they're even bigger inside. Okay, Steamtown. Steamtown's uh, number 26. It is its first year of operation after a 17 year overhaul. That's Mike on the rods, Paul Trainman, and uh, the conductor of Mike's uh, shadow on the ground. I just couldn't help but enjoy the, the circles. The straight lines, the texture of the, the men's uniforms. Last um, uh, December, yeah, 19, 2019, I was in Stranton. This is the 26th again, making all this fuss, all this smoke, this steam and stuff. And I look at this as like some old Hollywood movie. Again, shooting in, into the sun, into that backlight. Something you're not supposed to do. And creating the shadow of the men, particularly like the hat, indicating the training. And this steam, uh, we have steam heat. One of the few railroads in the United States that still has steam heat. And uh, as you can see, 26 is making quite a fuss. So even though you see a slap, slope back tender and there are only two cars and coaches, I like to think that maybe this is. Uh, one of the old limiteds, getting ready to go on a particularly frigid day. Number 26 again in Scranton. Uh, every 30 days, it's mandated by the Federal Railroad Administration that the steam locomotive, every 30 working days, have, a, um, have an inspection. And this, they have to drain the boiler entirely of water, uh, remove the fire brick, uh, clean up the flues, Take out all of the, uh, the, the wash inspection bolts, and wash down the, uh, the inside of the boiler, make sure there are no impurities gathering there, and so forth. Well, anyway, she had been working that day. So to rapidly get rid of uh, the steam, they open up the uh, snifter uh, valves on the cylinders. And with 170 pounds per square inch pressure, uh, it's a cacophony. You can have headphones, uh, earplugs in, and you can't hear yourself think. It's just outrageous. But anyway, during all of this stuff going on, uh, Andy Gardenia, uh, one of the Steamtown mechanics, he came into view and I was able to grab this shot. Number 26. I like to think of this as poor little 26 being about to be eaten by the big whale, the Mayog Tunnel. Now, our tunnel, interestingly enough, is one of the oldest uh, tunnels in the United States. It was built before the Civil War in 1855. It's 750 feet long. Uh, long. In any event, uh, I've been very blessed of going up to Steamtown in uh, November, December, and there'd be some snow. Steam in the snow, loved it. So, a little dusting of snow, and uh, the um, I'll have you know, I am uh, an FRA, uh, NORAC rules qualified uh, railroader. Uh, so being in this particular spot, I had permission from uh, Steamtown and the engine crew. Don't do this at, kid, at home, kids. I left the uh, graffiti there because uh, steam operating today is operating today. It's, it's in our environment. It is an alien life form. Um, and this is the reality of the day.
Ah, yes, back to that steamy uh, day. This is for our Santa Claus train. It's sent, it's steam train. Never in my life have I ever seen a steam locomotive making so much steam. Right? This is the embodiment of a steam engine. Uh, there's a boxcar behind the locomotive, and there's this uh, on the bottom is this uh, concrete abutment that's left over from uh, the Delaware Lackawanna Western's uh, steam column, that, uh, water column that used to be there. So uh, Dominic, the engineer, has opened up the cylinder cocks to make a reverse move. And so all of this stuff is emanating, <laughs> blasting out of the, uh, the bottom of the cylinders. Plus there is a, a you know, whistle, he's whistling as he's moving backwards. And um, also there might have been, uh, uh, maybe that's the uh, safety valve. And then there's a little bit from the injector. So it just went this, wow. So again, I'm breaking the rules. You can see over there on the right, this little circle, which is the sun. And uh, you know, shooting into this, get that depth, get that texture. Uh, I, I don't think with Kodachrome I could have gotten this. But with digital, I was. Few are the uh, opportunities to see a water tank in action. I think I saw one on the Durango and Silverton. Um, and here in New York City, there's no water tanks. But uh, in Strasbourg, they put up one, and it makes a lot of sense for them. And here I, I got to uh, take this picture. Uh, that's number 90, the Great Western uh, Railroad Decapod. Because I'm selfish, I wanted to do it again, but with a genuine mainline steam engine, one of the finest uh, passenger steam locomotives ever designed, ever built, ever, that ever ran. The Norfolk and Western, number 611, 484, uh, June 1950. It's only a little older than I am. And uh, one of the things about Strasbourg is that, for whatever reason, it's not a kind of a flat plane. They're, Unlike most railroads, which tend to be in a valley, Strasbourg's on a, a flat level They're all the way around it. So that's what makes Strasbourg so appealing photographically in the morning and the evening because the sun gets to go really low. Unlike, say, Jim Thorpe, where it gets dark at noon, here you get amazing sunsets. Also at Strasbourg last year. This one is perfectly indicative of how I feel. You never know unless you go. You can have all sorts of reasons and ideas that why it won't work. This is going to stink. I won't get anything good. Why bother? Well, I, of course, have seen shots from this very location with this magnificent uh, sunrise just over to the right of the locomotive. Spectacular backlighting and orange color, and, you know, great smoke plumes. Oh, man, it's just delicious. You can't resist it. Well, I paid you know, a fair amount of money to go for this uh, Peter Laro excursion. And of course, the day before had been brilliant. But that stuff with the uh, water tower, yes, nice and clear, wonderful. But of course, overnight, came in this fog bank. So while I was disappointed with that, I figured, well, let's do the best we can. And you know what? I think this one is one of my favorite steam locomotive images ever taken. It, it is so simple, yet it's so moody, it's so mysterious. It just speaks about the power, uh, the danger, uh, that it, and the scariness of large, these large machines that, uh, you know, human beings, we, we create Machines that use tremendous energy, like steam engines, diesels, uh, high-powered cars, airplanes. We make uh, weapons, or things like to make generate uh, generate electricity, like nuclear power plants. Um, in many ways, we struggle to control these incredible Im energies that we unleash. Which leads me to this next one. This is similar to one the CRPA members have seen before, uh, one recognition in one of the John Gruber 
contest with one that was taken seconds away from this one. This one I didn't enter because it's technically, it's a mess. You know, obviously, I took it at a very slow shutter speed. And uh, the car driven by Owen Hellbach, and even though it was a billiard cue flat road, still a little bumpy. And maybe I'm bumpy. I didn't hold it that steadily. But we were moving about 30 miles an hour, 25, 20, 30 miles an hour. And while this is technically flawed, fortunately, the uh, engineer leaning out, uh, his name is um, Shane Fredrickson, and that's his uh, son, Ryan, uh, right behind him. But in any event, the intense concentration on Shane's, not only his face, but on his whole body language. He's looking ahead. We're, we're in um, Nesquahone, Pennsylvania, and coming up is a, a, a couple of hidden uh, grade crossings, which are, you know, just always are. Dreadful thing for, to contemplate what could happen there. Therefore, though, since chain is sharp here and everything else is kind of screwed up, again, I feel like being less than technically perfect. It uh, goes to keep, goes to what we're what we're trying to capture. Human beings in control of these incredible machines. As speaking before, here's this one man, and this group of men in this cab, and they've got this locomotive, I don't know, I guess it's 180, 200 PSI boiler, that if you don't take care of it, you don't control it just right, make sure she's fed in, you know, the correct amount of water, this thing goes kaboom, resulting in your instant death. Instant, just before you know it, you, know, you don't even have a chance to realize what's going on. You're blown to smithereens. So Shane obviously is doing his best to ride this candle, ride this rocket. That's what he's doing. And he has for decades. Uh, one of an incredible engineer. Parting thoughts. Well, shameless plug time. I wrote a book along with my wife, Mel, and my children, uh, Kate and Matthew, uh, and the fabulous people at Schiffer Publishing. We made this one. It's called Smoke Over Steamtown, uh, published in 2017, and it's still available at your favorite bookseller. A lot of the photos that, you, that were here in, are in this book. Uh, bonus offer, send it, ship it directly to me. Once you purchase it, I'll autograph it and send it on to you. Well, like I said, I missed out on seeing real steam before it was gone in 1960. And like many others in the years following that date, I wanted to experience the glory of steam in any which way I could. Therefore, I'm eternally grateful to all the people who kept steam alive for everyone and not allowing steam's allure to fade. However, this does speak to the very fact of how seemingly permanent things are anything but. I wish to leave you with some thoughts from Railroading's finest writer, David P. Morgan. Here he is speaking about a 1980s revisit to an abandoned railroad that he and Philip Hastings experienced during their incredible search for steam in the 1950s. Morgan wrote, How temporal is transportation? Here, the Illinois Prairie is erasing the Big Four just as surely as the North Atlantic had smoothed over the wake of the Mauritania, the Rex, and the Ile de France. Transportation may be built for the ages, but more than most agencies and works of man, it had best be enjoyed at the moment, never assumed, ever considered an expendable experience. Look away, look away. I wish to thank 
the center, Scott Lotus, and all you wonderful people who are watching here today, thank you so much for watching. This is Dennis Livesey saying, see you, and see you again soon. Thank you so much.